Welcome to this lecture. In the previous lecture, we discussed the life history of low mass stars, stars like our own sun. In this lecture, we shall be discussing the evolution of slightly more massive stars, the intermediate mass stars. So let's go back to the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. A plot of luminosity versus temperature, luminosity increasing vertically and temperature increasing as we go from life right to left horizontally. This diagonal band is the zero age main sequence of stars. In the previous lecture, we discussed the low mass stars. Today, we shall be discussing these intermediate mass stars. Before we do that, let us very quickly recall the main results of our earlier discussion concerning the evolution of low mass stars. These are the low mass stars. The sun is somewhere over there. One solar luminosity and a surface temperature of about 6000 degrees. So let us quickly summarize everything we discussed in the previous lecture with the help of this one single slide. Here is the main sequence of stars and here is a star with a mass equal to one solar mass. For most of its life, more than 90% of its life, it will spend on the main sequence during which right at the center of the star it will be converting hydrogen to helium through fusion reaction. Over a period of time, helium core will develop right at the center of the star. As I explained in great detail in the previous lecture, this helium core will be inert, meaning that helium will not combine with other helium nuclei to form heavier element, for example carbon, because the temperature isn't high enough. You need a temperature of 100 million degrees to fuse two helium nuclei together. And we don't have that temperature. So the inert core will be squeezed by gravity because the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium has been upset now because of the lack of energy generation right at the center. And as the core contracts, the rest of the star, the envelope of the star will expand. This is the Gravo thermal catastrophe, which I explained twice last time. And the star will ascend from the main sequence to the giant branch. When it becomes a giant, its surface temperature will drop because the luminosity remains the same. And since the luminosity of a star is given by 4 pi r squared, which is the surface area, multiplied by sigma t to the power 4, Stefan's law, because the luminosity, the left-hand side is the same, and because r squared has increased, the temperature has to drop, and that is why the star has a more reddened appearance. So you will have a red giant star. Then the core will get hot because there is a furnace surrounding the central inert helium core where hydrogen is being converted to helium and that energy will conduct into the helium core and the helium core will finally attain a temperature of 100 million degrees and helium will fuse and carbon will begin to form. And because of the sudden energy generation, the helium core will expand. And when the core expands, the star contracts. Just as when the core contracts, the star expanded. In a similar fashion, when the core expands, the star will contract. So the star will descend from the giant branch over there. And then it will ascend once again along the giant branch but this time it will become even larger star. It will become a red supergiant. Right at the center of the core, 
helium has converted part of it to carbon and with a little admixture of oxygen. So in a red supergiant star, what you have right at the center is an inert carbon-oxygen core surrounded by helium still fusing to form carbon, which is surrounded by hydrogen still continuing to convert to helium and so on. Then the red supergiant star becomes pulsationally unstable. It begins to oscillate and the amplitude of the oscillation increases and the outer layers of the star, the entire envelope, is rejected like the snake sheds its skin. Now this <coughs> ejected shell expands into the interstellar medium with a velocity which will be just larger than the escape velocity from the red supergiant star. I leave it to you to calculate what should be the escape velocity from a star with a mass of the sun with a radius of 300 solar radius or 300 million kilometers. Calculate the escape velocity. So with that velocity, the ejected shell will expand into the interstellar medium and that is known as the planetary nebula. So let us now repeat. The main sequence dwarf, dwarf ascends to a giant branch, becomes a red giant, then it becomes a red supergiant, then it becomes pulsationally unstable and ejects its entire uh, envelope, and then what is left is the inner carbon-oxygen core whose radius is roughly the radius of the Earth, and since there is no energy generation, it will cool, it will become degenerate, and it will become a white dwarf. And we shall discuss the story of the white dwarf in a separate lecture. So, to summarize once again, for stars in the lower main sequence, the story ends with the formation of the degenerate carbon-oxygen core. The core will never get hot enough to ignite carbon for which a temperature of 500 million degrees is required the envelope of the star is ejected and the core will eventually cool and become a carbon-oxygen white dwarf. And when the envelope which has been ejected will expand into the interstellar medium and these objects, and we know lots and lots of them, are known as planetary nebula. Now let's get on with our discussion of the intermediate mass stars which is the topic of today's lecture. Well, more or less, it will be along the same lines as the lower mass stars, but with one or two essential differences. So we're going to discuss stars in this region, say three solar mass stars, just to be specific. Stars more massive than about three solar mass will de develop a well-defined helium core over a course of time, just as the sun will develop a well-defined helium core. Now here is the important difference compared to a star like the Sun. Detailed calculations show that the helium core will be non-degenerate and it will be isothermal and it will grow in mass over a course of time. Why will it be non-degenerate? Because if you now calculate what the value of Kt is, and what the value of the Fermi energy is, you will find that Kt is much larger than the Fermi energy Ef. Therefore, the core, the helium core, will be non-degenerate and it will obey the ideal classical gas equation of state, namely Boyle's law. Why will it be isothermal? Well, a core of that density will be highly conducting. It will be highly conducting both as far as electricity is concerned, which is not relevant for our discussion, and as far as heat is concerned. Take a metal, for example. A metal is a good conductor because there are a lot of free electrons. Therefore, a metal is isothermal. It's very difficult to establish a temperature gradient in a metal. Very quickly, it will become isothermal. Namely, the entire sample will be at the same temperature. Therefore, it's perfectly reasonable to assert that the 
the helium core, the non-degenerate helium core, will be isothermal. Now, long, long time ago, 80 years ago, or more than that, Chandrasekhar and one of his young research associates, named Schoenberg, showed that equilibrium exists only as long as the isothermal core of the star has a ma mass less than roughly 0 0.1 times the mass of the star, 10% of the mass of the star. Now that was at that stage in 1941 just a mathematical theorem, the sort of theorems that Chandrasekhar was very fond of proving. 60, 70, 80 years later, this theorem has acquired great significance, as we shall now see when we invoke it. Now, what I have shown in this plot, in the vertical axis, y-axis, is the radius of the core increasing as I go vertically up. What is plotted on the x-axis is the mass of the helium core and a particular mass that is plotted here is Q Schoenberg Chandrasekhar times the mass of the star. Not the mass of the core, but the mass of the star. So if it is a three solar mass star, that is three solar mass. Now what is QSC? As I told you, it is roughly 0 0.1. Therefore, this fiducial mark represents 0. Point, represents the mass of the core having a value equal to 0 0.1 times the mass of the entire star. Now let us discuss what is plotted here. The core has a certain mass initially, a very small mass. It has a fairly large radius, such as shown in this picture, and the core grows in mass. As the core grows in mass, the radius remains more or less the same till it reaches this point. When it reaches that point of inflection, something dramatic happens. The core suddenly contracts because this is an unstable region. Because uh, what this represents is that the mass of the core decreasing. If the mass of the core decreases, you, you, you cannot have a curve with a slope like this. So this dashed red line represents an unstable branch of this curve, zigzag curve. Therefore, the core will suddenly contract. Why will it contract? It will contract because it has to jump from this branch, which is allowed, to this branch, which is now allowed. So there is a sudden contraction in the core from an initial radius of R core, 1 to final radius of R subscript core 2. Now let's invoke our gravothermal catastrophe theorem. When the core contracts, the star will have to expand and therefore the star will become a giant. The same story that we discussed in the previous lecture. Except this transformation from a dwarf star to a giant star doesn't occur over a very long period of time, but it occurs rather suddenly <clears throat> because there is an instability here which makes the star jump from this radius to this radius. So this is a discontinuous jump in the radius. It is like first order phase transition when you go from, say, water to ice. So now <clears throat> let us understand this properly. When the helium core grows in mass to roughly 0 0.1 times the mass of the star, it will suddenly contract because Chandrasekhar and Schoenberg had shown that this is what will happen as long as the core remains isothermal and there should be no argument about the core being isothermal, meaning at the same temperature everywhere. The sudden contraction of the core will cause the envelope to expand very suddenly the star will become a giant. Now, the luminosity of the star, as I explained a few minutes ago, is its surface area of 4 pi r squared multiplied by sigma t to the power 4. When the core is doing these dramatic things, the luminosity of the star doesn't change. Its energy generation rate is not changing. Therefore, 
the, since the radius expands, the temperature will stop, drop, and therefore the star will become reddened, and the star will become a red giant, just as the sun will become a red giant. But in this case, it will happen very suddenly. Now, what has this got to do with the price of fish, as they say? Now, let us look at this hertzsprung russell diagram, which has been populated with a million stars that was observed by the Hipparchus satellite. As I said last time, Hipparchus satellite was launched to measure accurately the distances to more than a million stars, and it did. Once you know the distance, you know the luminosity precisely, because from inverse square law, you can calculate what its intrinsic luminosity is, and of course the surface temperature you measure spectroscopically. Now, this is the giant branch which we discussed in the last lecture, which I repeated during the introduction to this lecture. So, you see there is a continuous giant branch. The sun will ascend this giant branch, and here there is a traffic jam where it will settle down for a while as a red giant before contracting again. But you notice over here, we are discussing intermediate mass stars. If these stars have to become giant, why don't we see them going through? Well, we don't see them going through because the contraction of the core and this is sudden, resulting in a very sudden expansion of the core. Therefore, the star more or less jumps in a very short time scale in astronomical units, that is, from there to there. So, in recent times, this Hertzsprung gap, the gap between the main sequence and the giant branch, which is not there for low mass stars, this Hertzsprung gap was a mystery for many decades. Then people invoked the Schoenberg Chandrasekhar theorem to explain this Hertzsprung Russell gap in terms of the sudden contraction of the inert helium core, sorry, uh, isothermal helium core, and a consequent expansion of the star. Now, so let's repeat it in this picture. This is the main sequence of stars, and here is the Hayashi line which I referred to in the previous lecture. The significance of the Hayashi line is to the right of this dashed sloping line. There is no hydrostatic equilibrium possible. The star becomes completely convective and it's mechanically unstable. And the star will, just as the sun ascended the giant branch in a continuous fashion, here a star in the upper main sequence which is the intermediate mass star, will sort of jump to this giant branch and will ascend the giant branch and the core contraction now resulting in the transformation to a giant. So this is what we now believe will be the story of the evolution of intermediate mass stars. So let's repeat. The helium core of these intermediate mass, mass stars will be non-degenerate. You can calculate Kt and show that it is much larger than the Fermi energy EF. The result of helium burning will be a carbon core with a little admixture of oxygen, and this core will now be degenerate. Whereas the helium core was not degenerate, the carbon core will be degenerate because the carbon core will contract to a very small radius, just as it did when a star like the Sun develops a degenerate carbon core, when it became a red supergiant. Now one would expect the core to eventually attain a temperature of 500 million degrees when carbon will fuse to form oxygen and other heavy elements. How did it get hot? We said when the degenerate core contracts, there will be no heating because pressure and temperature are unrelated for a degenerate Fermi gas. Well, you remember there is still an outside furnace. Now there are two outside furnaces. Your pizza is being baked in an oven which has run out of fuel. But there is an outside furnace where hydrogen, helium is still being converted to carbon. Surrounding that outside furnace, there is yet another outside furnace where hydrogen is still being converted to helium. Therefore, by conduction process, 
the degenerate carbon core will eventually heat up to 500 million degrees and carbon will fuse. Now, when does this happen? Well, there is a competition here. Competition between what? Well, there is a competition between heating and cooling. Why is the core getting heated? Because of conduction. And why is it getting cool? Because it's creating neutrinos which carry away energy and entropy. So let me remind you once again about neutrinos which we discussed in the lecture, the fourth lecture on energy generation in stars. The neutrino was first postulated by Wolfgang Pauli in 1933 in the context of beta decay of radioactive nuclei. It was eventually dis discovered nearly 300 years later and what happens is in a beta decay is that the neutron decays spontaneously to a proton, electron and a neutrino. Well, it's actually an anti-neutrino. We'll worry about this when we discuss the solar neutrino puzzle, but right now we'll simply call it a neutrino, an electron neutrino. Now, that was the original process in which neutrino was postulated and then discovered the radioactive decay of a neutron to a proton. But there are many other processes in which neutrinos are produced. This could not have been anticipated in the 1930s or 40s, and one had to wait till the late 1960s when the electromagnetic forces and the weak forces of radioactivity were unified into a unified theory by Weinberg, Salam, and Glashow, for which they got the Nobel Prize. In this unified theory of electromagnetic and weak forces, neutrinos are produced in all kinds of other processes. For example, an electron and positron can collide to produce a neutrino and an antineutrino. Photons can produce neutrinos. A photon can scatter off an electron like in Compton scattering, and what you will have is an electron, and instead of the photon, you have a neutrino and an antineutrino. If you have a plasma, a plasma can also produce a neutrino. Plasma oscillations, which we briefly mentioned when we discussed the spiral structure of galaxies, plasma oscillation is the relative oscillation between positive and negative charges in a plasma. That plasma can decay into neutrino, antineutrino pairs. Then there is the Bremsstrahler neutrino. Bremsstrahlung is the deceleration radiation, which we shall discuss in a later lecture. So when an electron scatters off a nucleus, normally we say it emits a photon. This is known as Bremsstrahlung, break radiation. Usually X-rays are produced. But you could also have a situation where electron scattering off a nucleus produces Neutro neutrino and antineutrino processes. Therefore, the neutrino, regardless of which process it is produced in, becomes very important in the cooling of the core of the star. Why? Neutrinos interact extremely weakly with matter. That's why it took 28 years before it was discovered. Its mean free path is incredibly small. We said in the case of the sun, whose mean density is only rough 1 gram per cubic centimeter, just the density of water, little over that 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter, the mean free path of the photons to Thompson scattering is only half a centimeter. We said that Superman can't even see the tip of his nose because the photon scattered from the nose will not reach his eye. But neutrinos travel a very large distance. If you consider a dense material like lead, the mean free path of the neutrino in a matter with the density of lead is many light years. Light years, the distance light will travel in one year. It's an awfully long distance. So the neutrinos interact incredibly weakly with matter. And since they carry away energy and entropy, a large neutrino luminosity produced by a variety of processes will cool the core very effectively.
Now, let us go back to this fierce competition. The inert carbon core is being heated by conduction from the surrounding furnace. The surrounding furnace is where helium is still being converted to carbon and oxygen. But it is also being cooled by neutrino emission. So the question is who is going to win out? All the carbon core is interested in is attaining a temperature of 500 million degrees when it can combine two carbon nuclei can combine to form oxygen and other elements. So there is a stiff competition between heating and cooling. Now detailed calculations show that the cooling due to neutrinos delays the core reaching the critical temperature of 500 million degrees till the mass of the core grows to a certain critical value. And calculations show that it should grow roughly to about 1.4 solar mass. This 1.4 solar mass should not be confused with 1.4 solar mass, which we shall encounter later on. This could be 1.3 solar mass, 1.35 solar mass. I'm saying roughly 1.4 solar mass. This is what detailed calculations are showing us. Now, when this critical temperature is reached, when the mass of the core finally attains this mass of roughly 1.4 solar mass, carbon will ignite. So let's go back to this plot of log temperature increasing vertically and log density, density increasing horizontally. We are concerned, we are considering the inert carbon oxygen core of an intermediate mass star. Up here, roughly at that temperature, I'm going to draw a horizontal line. The significance of that horizontal line is the following. This is the temperature at which the cooling due to neutrinos becomes roughly equal to the heating due to the conduction Heat, heating of the core due to conduction. So, what is below the line and what is above the line? Below the line, cooling due to neutrinos is much greater than the increase in the temperature of the core due to heat conduction. So, neutrino cooling dominates below this horizontal line. And above that horizontal line, the increase in temperature due to heat conduction from the outside furnace becomes larger than the cooling due to the neutrinos and there will be a runaway nuclear fusion. Why will it be a runaway nuclear fusion? Because our carbon core is degenerate. Every time you ignite a degenerate core, it has no option but to blow up. But let us see this through. Let us start with the mass of the core when it is roughly about 0 0.8 times the mass of the sun. After some time, the mass of the core will grow to 1.2 solar mass. Why will the mass of the carbon core grow? Because there is an outside furnace which is still cooking helium to carbon and therefore the mass of the carbon core will increase. Now you will say I have made a silly mistake in drawing this because when the mass of the core becomes larger, the core should become larger. Because if you go to the market, a one kilogram weight will be that big, a two kilogram weight will be bigger. So how come a core which is more massive is smaller? We will discuss that when we come to Chandrasekhar's theory of white dwarf. That is one of the most remarkable properties of uh, degenerate star. But let's not get into that right now. And then the mass of the core grows further to 1.3 solar mass till finally the mass of the core grows to roughly 1.4 solar mass. At, at that point, carbon will ignite. It will attain a temperature of 500 million degrees. The cooling by neutrinos cannot stop this ignition from occurring. 
When carbon ignites, all hell will break loose. So let us go through this story once again. I have a degenerate core at a temperature T and a pressure P. There is an increase in energy generation, increase in luminosity. That will result in the core getting hotter, but the pressure will still remain the same because the pressure has nothing to do with temperature in a degenerate matter. So since the core is now hotter, the fusion reaction will proceed even faster. It will increase the luminosity of the core, which will heat the core even more, but the pressure will still remain the same. And the fusion reaction will go even faster and faster and faster, and what you have is really a bomb. That is the difference between a nuclear reactor in which the fission reaction, there we are talking of fission and not fusion, a heavy nucleus breaking up into two, but it doesn't matter. The, the point I'm trying to make is, in a nuclear reactor, the fission reaction is controlled, whereas in an atom bomb, like in the Hiroshima bomb, the fission reaction is uncontrolled. So here we are talking of uncontrolled fusion reaction, a hydrogen bomb-like situation. Therefore, the carbon core will explode, resulting in the explosion of the star itself. Now, the reaction rate for fusion of carbon is incredibly sensitive to temperature. Why is it incredibly sensitive to temperature? Because as the temperature increases, the mean energy of the particle increases, and therefore the tunneling probability for fusion, the quantum mechanical tunneling probability, which is an exponential function, dramatically increases. Now, in the 1980s, even up to the 1990s, this was thought to be the origin of type 1 supernovae. Supernovae represent explosions of stars. And there are different kinds of supernovae. Astronomers are very imaginative. They call them type 1, type 2, and so on. So, what is the origin of type 1 supernovae? In the 1980s, people thought it was due to the carbon detonation or the explosion of the carbon-oxygen degenerate core of intermediate mass stars when it attains a temperature of 500 million degrees. Today, we don't believe that. And we don't believe that for also a very good observational reasons. We now have concrete evidence that stars up to nine solar mass, let alone three solar mass, save themselves from this catastrophe. What is the catastrophe? An explosion due to runaway fusion reaction and fine pieces white dwarfs. So today we know from observation, three solar mass, four solar mass, five solar mass, stars up to seven, eight, nine solar mass somehow save themselves from this carbon detonation catastrophe. How did one discover this? Here is the Pleiades cluster, a recently formed young open cluster. These are massive stars, blue stars. What was discovered in the late 1980s, in the early 1990s, are white dwarfs in these open clusters. These clusters have massive stars in them, and they also have low mass stars in them, but they also have dead stars in them, white dwarfs. I mentioned how white dwarfs are formed. They are the end states of evolution of stars. Now, this is an intriguing puzzle. In a young star like Pleiades, one finds white dwarfs. You may say, why not? And yet, stars as massive as seven or eight solar mass are still shining. These are massive stars which are still shining, seven, eight, nine solar mass. White dwarfs are the end states of stars, when the stellar drama ends and the core will no longer get hot enough for the nuclear reaction to proceed and the core will cool and become degenerate and become a white dwarf. Now let us go back to our third lecture, why are the stars as they are? We saw that 
the luminosity of a star is proportional to m to the power 3 or 3.5. Therefore, the lifetime of the star, which is the stored energy of the star, which is roughly mc squared, divided by the rate at which the star is radiating energy, which is the luminosity of the star, is 1 over m to the power 2.5. Therefore, the more massive stars will live for a much shorter time. They will also evolve much faster because their luminosities are much greater. Therefore, if you find white dwarfs in a young cluster like Pleiades, you know one thing for sure, that the progenitors of these white dwarfs must have been stars more massive than the most massive stars currently to be found in the cluster. If you have stars of 7, 8 solar mass still shining, still on the main sequence, then a star which has died must surely have been more massive. Otherwise, it couldn't have evolved faster than a 7 and 8 solar mass star and ended its life. And the degenerate star is to be found in the graveyard of white dwarfs. So that is a very remarkable observation of discovery that gave us the clue about how these intermediate mass stars save themselves. I hope this argument is clear. You can go back and play back again and listen to me explaining this once more. But let me proceed. So here is my cartoon of an intermediate mass star. And what I have right at the center is a degenerate carbon oxygen core. Surrounding that, you have the envelope of the star, which is enormous, many millions of kilometers in size. Now, this degenerate carbon oxygen core grows in mass because there is a furnace outside where helium is still being converted to carbon and that adds to the mass of the carbon core. The carbon core will not ignite unless the mass of the core reaches roughly 1.4 solar mass. Why will it not ignite? Because the cooling due to neutrinos, which are from produced in a variety of processes, cools the core and prevents it from attaining a temperature of 500 million degrees. In that process, if the star manages to lose its entire envelope, then it can save itself. Then the core cannot grow in mass because you have got rid of not only the envelope, you have got rid of the outer furnace. Why will a star lose mass? Well, we know stars lose mass. The sun loses mass all the time. It's called the solar wind. And the solar wind can be detected if you just go outside the Earth's atmosphere. Now, more massive stars, known as wolf rayet stars, we will discuss this when we discuss binary star evolution, they lose mass in a very rapid fashion. The details of how an intermediate mass star suddenly loses the envelope is not clear. In a lower mass star like the Sun, what happens is that the red supergiant becomes pulsationally unstable and ejects the, 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 the outer layers. But in this case, the details are not clear. But astronomers are convinced because we see mass loss processes very clearly. People believe that this is how the star saves itself. Before this core reaches the critical mass when carbon can ignite, somehow or other, the details are not clear, somehow or other, stars in nature manage to get rid of its envelope and save itself. Now, if the, if the envelope is lost before the core grows to a mass of roughly 1.4 solar mass, carbon will not ignite. The core will become a carbon-oxygen white dwarf. So, here is the summary of what I have said in the first lecture and what I have said in this lecture. What I have plotted here is a box 
which represents the final state of stars of various initial masses. Low mass star, slightly more massive star, more massive stars, very massive stars, and so on. So let us plot what is the end state of the stars of various masses. Let us first consider stars whose mass is less than about half a solar mass. As I said already in the earlier lecture, they will become helium white dwarfs. In other words, they will convert hydrogen to helium, but helium will never get hot enough in these low mass stars. Mass less than half a solar mass, helium will never ignite. In the sun it will ignite, but not in a half a solar mass star. Therefore, stars with mass of less than half a solar mass will end their lives as helium white dwarfs. Stars between half a solar mass and nine solar mass will end their lives as white dwarfs, and they will be carbon oxygen white dwarfs. There was an uncertainty about stars in this mass range. We thought they will explode. In the 1980s, people thought they will explode. But now, since we have found white dwarfs and young clusters with massive stars in them, in open clusters like Pleiades, we have to conclude the stars up to nine solar mass save themselves somehow, and the result will be a carbon oxygen white dwarf. And in the next lecture, we shall deal with the evolution and the final state, the end state of more massive stars. So we shall be discussing the evolution of massive stars, which will be dramatically different from what we discussed in this lecture and what we discussed in the previous lecture. I shall end on that note, but before I conclude, may I request you once again that it is very useful for me to have your feedback on these lectures. So do take a few minutes and enter your remarks in the comments in YouTube after you view each of these lectures. Because this feedback is very important for me because I am used to blackboard lecturing and not online lecturing. So do please enter, send me your remarks. Thank you very much for your attention.